Doug Bowles. I'm a, a member of the economics faculty here at uh, UMKC and uh, the associate director of a research group called the Center for Economic Information. And uh, for the last couple, well, three, four years, I guess now, we've been uh, working on a project, a research project, in collaboration with Children's Mercy Hospital here in Kansas City uh, that's looking at the relationship between, or the, the hypothesized relationship between a, a housing condition survey, the, the results of a housing condition survey that we're able to have been uh, applying in the city of Kansas City, Missouri since the year 2000. And, uh, between the relationship between housing conditions measured by that survey and, uh, and childhood asthma and lead poisoning and injury. Now, uh, the, original, uh, the original research team included Ben Wilson and, and Neil who started with us back at the very beginning, and Ben has since uh, graduated and moved on to SUNY Cortland, where he's got a position on the faculty there, but he's kind of carried that research agenda with him. He stayed on the research team. Uh, Neil and, and Natalie uh, Kane, Neil Wilson, Natalie Kane are uh, both current members of the research team working on finishing up that research and getting publications out, and also working on a project going forward still in collaboration with Children's Mercy, but aimed at formalizing a set of institutional research relationships that, have, that grew up as part of that research uh, called the Health, research, Health Data Research Consortium for the Kansas City region with a, a focus on a long-term uh, research agenda in he uh, regional health disparities, broadly construed. Now, with, with just that much introduction, I'm going to stop and hand things over to this group of eminent scholars, who it's also been my rare privilege to have had all of them in class at different times over the preceding year. So, uh, Ben, we'll start with you. Well, that's the first time I've been called eminent. <laughs> I will treasure it forever, and I'm glad that it's been recorded for posterity. <laughs> highlight of my day. So the, the title sounds scary and it sounds very boring, but really what I want to talk about is that this very practical tool, geocoding, and the iterative process that we've developed as really a practical problem-solving uh, device to match housing conditions information to actual health outcomes of children provides a wide range of uh, ways of discussing and thinking about the distribution of inequality across our urban spaces. And so having come from this tremendous panel on aesthetics and rhetoric, I, I really feel that geography and GIS is a technical, technological device that really allows us to tell a very compelling narrative about how and where socioeconomic inequality emerges and why it's persistent, that introduces all sorts of things like history, production and technology systems, etc. And so my job here through this presentation will introduce you to a little bit more closely to the research that Doug uh, described and the Kansas City area and its geography that will be in all the following slides to come. So I'll talk a little bit about KC Hart, Kansas City's ge uh, geography and this geocoding process. So KC Hart, this task force is really about investigating the relationship between housing and our environments and the health outcomes that come from those environments. So mold in the house, dust, uh, if your furnace filter is not properly changed on a regular basis. Uh, one of the motivators for this research is that the doctors at Children's Mercy Hospital were seeing a pattern of children returning with severe asthmatic exacerbation. And once they were in the hospital three consecutive times in a, in a calendar year, they were enrolled in an early intervention program where somebody would go to the house and they would notice that there were, were things that could be fixed in the house to treat the symptoms of asthma. And as this research has progressed in other areas, they found that the treatment of the house can be more effective than pharmaceutical treatments in many cases. 
So the, the relationship be between environment and health uh, is one that we're very curious about. And the relationship between housing conditions and the broader socioeconomic situations that those houses uh, are fit within. So GIS is becoming more prominent. You know, we see it regularly in NPR stories. Uh, the Brookings Institute here has got this nice map uh, showing us high rates of unemployment in relation to high prescription r rates of opioids. So the, these sorts of stories, you know, provides a form for developing spaces where we need to start thinking about why this is occurring and what's different, for example, in Tennessee and Kentucky from uh, Minnesota, for example, where we don't have those things correlating. But one of the problems with this sort of analysis is that while we all live in these various states, we live in very specific spaces in these uh, states. So a blanket sort of policy prescription might not be uh, a good one, just as a, a blanket pill for a particular disease wouldn't necessarily be a good treatment option. You need a more holistic approach, a centered approach to these sorts of things. So Kansas City, uh, our area of analysis goes right here. A little uh, circle right there, and this is this is what it looks like. The Greater Kansas City area takes place in both states. Uh, this one here is the county level geography. So this is what a level of geography that we would usually see this sort of opioid addiction, unemployment, sort of national geography. And right in the middle here, this is Kansas City, Missouri, and we're right about there. As I'm, I've had too much coffee, I guess. <laughs> But we can see that Kansas City, Missouri, as we drive around this town, is a very large place. A lot of different neighborhoods and a lot of different cultures and activities, etc. So, this is a uh, this is uh, these larger scale analyses are are somewhat uh, you know wanting in what's going on and developing how we can start to approach these. Here we have the zip code level of geography again, a very popular uh, geography for these sort of national level surveys. And here we have the census block, which is a, a much smaller space for analyzing. And then we have the neighborhoods dividing up the city itself, which is really where a lot of our research is taking place at the neighborhood level, because this is where we live and conduct our daily lives in the production of space, et cetera. So in thinking about how we're gonna study the relationship between childhood health outcomes and their housing conditions, we had the particular problem of matching uh, the data from the hospital, all the childhood encounters over a 15 year period to this uh, geographic space where we have housing conditions data for, which is a geography that changes year after year because the city had a different demand for uh, where they wanted the survey to take place starting in 2000 with a very general, broad, large uh, survey to more particularly and targeted spaces in the years to follow based on you know financial constraints, et cetera to another uh, set of geographies. It was an NIH grant, which was uh, one mile radii of random samples across the metropolitan area. So how do we match all of these data to these uh, different geographies and know that we're not only matching it to the correct parcel, uh, but how many of them were correctly matching? So we could set up an address locator of the parcels that we have, but that wouldn't give us any sort of meaningful indication of how many were actually matching because there's 15,000 asthma cases in a particular year and only 500 parcels to match them at. Have we found the right ones and matched all that we possibly could? So we had to get a little bit creative in thinking about how to assess completeness and repeatability. So how do we do this not only for year one, but for every single year so that we know we're getting the same sorts of match rates across all the years and that somebody else can come in and do the same thing and get the same match rates, uh, et cetera. So what we developed was an iterative approach. And most of the literature talks about the, the costs and benefits of two really specific types of geocoding. One is to the street centerline file. The street centerline file allows um, a high match rate with pretty good accuracy, uh, but all the street segments are uh, divided by a range of addresses. So it matches to either the segment in different areas along the, the space, 
but not to the exact parcel. The parcel match rate has its difficulties because some parcels have multiple addresses. Right? We have a 100 block and a half or a B or a C associated where the city parcel geography would only have one address. So we've got to figure out a way to get the, those incorporated. So just to give us another sense of scale, so there's Kansas City, whoop, there's Kansas City, Missouri again. Here's one of our neighborhoods that's been analyzed across a, a number of the, uh, the years, the Likens neighborhood. This is also home to the urban farming guys, if any of you are familiar with them doing some tremendous work in Kansas City in uh, addressing food sovereignty and uh, insecurity issues. Uh, panel B here, this is the centerline geography, and C here is the parcel geography. So you can tell that we are getting to a very fine level of analysis and where health and housing uh, is taking place and thinking about how this emerges. So here is our centerline geography for the space along with the matches for the year 2000 of the asthma outcomes. And we can see that there's some patterning and some clustering in particular areas. It's a little bit difficult to tell, but the numbers are enormous here in the middle, the old part of the city, Kansas City, Missouri. And here's an example of the, the problem with the center line matching. You know, it naturally clusters them either at the end of the node uh, or in areas that we're not necessarily interested in. So when I say moving geography, uh, this is a segment of the 2000 survey that takes place in roughly this area up here. So we're able with the centerline file to match uh, a very high number of the cases but not all those cases mat would match to a house that we have housing conditions survey data to. So uh, we were able to create an aggregate geography of the neighborhoods in which we added up the centerline geography as a count and then ran the parcel level match process, secondary, and then got a percentage of how many of the parcels were being matched. And then we were able to go through and manually match the ones that were left over. So you could zoom all the way into the street center line space and we can click on each individual parcel. This was awesomely tedious. How many do you have to do? A lot. Uh, 5,000 probably. <laughs> you get really good at it. And uh, you know, it helps when it's Royals baseball season and they're winning lots of games. And you know, you got that in the background. But uh, you know, this is very exciting, especially to the environmental health community. Uh, one of the places where we presented this is uh, it's at San Antonio at their national conference. And uh, most of the people were really interested in this process and how it was executed and the cost and the time and all of this because especially in major metropolitan areas, this is a problem. You know, they, can, they can't specifically identify where the match would occur and we were able to do this uh, through this process and in the process have a much higher match rate, use much more of the available data and really get a, a an intimate <laughs> understanding of the geography of Kansas City in the process. Uh, so one of the ancillary benefits of this, not only for answering the specific question, is that we also get this cumulative collection of shapefiles where these asthma cases are occurring not only for each individual year, but for the the surveys before the city as a whole. And so what that enables us, the possibility of doing is thinking about where these are occurring at all the levels of geography above it. Whereas, you know, Raj Chetty or some of these other uh, analysis of large scale geographies, they don't have the, any way of zooming in or down or up. Uh, and we're able to look at them in all these different spaces. So, so zip code, pattern, block group, the patterns persist, and we're even more targeted as to where the, the real concentrations are for you know, na uh, neighborhood action, education strategies, all sorts of policy starts to emerge from this sort of targeted information. And then one of the other things that we want to think about is all these boundaries that we are used to using are administrative, socially constructed boundaries. You know, 
gerrymandering becomes an issue, something that we should be thinking about. And so uh, we, we've been playing with some alternative geographies, and this is something that's used uh, when we're looking at natural systems, is the creation of grids. So one mile, two mile, three mile, half mile gets too small, you can't really <laughs> make it out for this larger space, but it's a way of seeing the robustness of the spatial patterns, because we as human beings unfortunately see patterns often that don't exist, because that's just the way our eye and our brain works. But this is an effective way of addressing that concern here, where across all of these geographies and spaces, the pattern in the historic east neighborhoods of Kansas City seems to emerge. So the, the darker the color, the more concentrated the asthma. You bet. Good question. All right. So with that, uh, now that you know the lay of the land, my colleagues are going to talk about a range of other issues, including lead and discrimination and blockbusting, et cetera. Thank you. Um, thanks, Ben. Uh, thank you all for coming and listening to us talk. Um, I'm going to talk about childhood lead poisoning. Uh, in the human environment in general, I'm going to talk about uh, childhood lead poisoning uh, and its remediation, uh, and in fact, the understanding of childhood lead poisoning itself as being uh, potential places for application uh, of uh, MMT and uh, the possibilities excuse me, that it engenders. Right. So um, this is sort of the framework of uh, the discussion about lead, right? We banned lead paint uh, some 40 years ago. It's been about 30 years ago since lead gasoline was pretty much limited, uh, eliminated. Uh, lead in uh, the use of uh, foods and, and that sort of stuff is pretty, you know, it's been gone. Uh, furthermore, when you actually look at the amount of lead poisoning in children, it's, it's fallen precipitously. Right? And it's gone from 40 years ago, some 15 micrograms per deciliter, uh, down to now you have uh, nearly 100% of the population, 97.5, uh, of the children aged 1 to 5, right, have less than 5 uh, micrograms per deciliter. So, right, you know, shouldn't lead be a dead issue? We're solving this problem, right? Um, well, no, not at all. Um, uh, for one thing, there were millions of tons of lead, tens of millions, uh, hundreds of millions of tons of uh, industrial lead deposited during the 20th century, right? Uh, not only through gasoline and paint, uh, but also actually through uh, actual industrial applications, uh, things like, as the uh, situation in Flint has pointed out, uh, through water systems, etc. cetera. Right? So it still persists in the lived environment. And the persistence of it in the lived environment is spread unequally throughout society, right? Uh, and that's sort of what uh, GIS has the ability for us to really focus in on, really get a good look at it. And uh, what we had, uh, oh, there you go. Um, uh, what we have there is a little spatial clustering, right? Um, uh, the population is, uh, is in, as far as uh, class and ethnicity, is uh, different uh, there than it is mm, there. Sorry, I've got a lot of coffee in me. Um, so, uh, so there's da there's the danger is unequally spread out, right? And then the final amount is, although the levels of lead have fallen radically, there is no safe amount of blood lead. And as this quote says at the bottom, there is no such thing as short-term exposure uh, to lead. And I'm just going to read this because I think it really drives it home. Research finds that declines in reading ability, educational achievement, deficits in vocabulary, fine motor skills, reaction time, hand-eye coordination, ADHD, poor organizational skills, violence, poor impulse control. Those are immediate effects. Uh, while long-term effects 
uh, on cognitive function and socioeconomic status. All of this follows from exposure from lead, right? So um, this, is, this is what's at stake here. Um, and this led uh, this man named Claire Patterson, 1980, to say essentially it's only a matter of time before we've made, we realize that we've made our urban environment systematically uninhabitable, OK? Um, and my, my talk is going to kind of split in two. The, the first part of the talk will be a discussion of the history of lead poisoning and Claire Patterson. And that has implications for MMT. And then I'm going to come back around to the more immediately research I've been doing with the application of the uh, geocoding process to the uh, lead uh, in Kansas City. Right. So um, we've known lead is toxic for a long time, right? Uh, over 2,000 years ago, uh, this Greek physician, Pedanius Discordiais, uh, said, you know, lead makes you crazy. Um, and there is some discussion, probably people know about it, the idea that uh, it was the lead water system that led to the, you know, decline of the Roman Empire. This is contested, but um, there's an attitude about lead poisoning, sometimes referred to in the literature as the aping disease. I read that long list of effects of lead. So pretty much anywhere, some historians say, anywhere they see an incidence of hypertension, for instance, they say, well, you really should look at what's going on in that society for lead toxicity. Right? That's one of the, the sure signs that that, that could be. Uh, but the actual medical literature, what we recognize today as the medical literature, begins in France. I won't uh, trouble you with my French pronunciation, but 1839, right? Uh, by the turn of the century, it was clear that people working in industrial environments had seizures, hallucinations, tremors, something called wrist drop, which is something that happened to painters. Um, it was clear that that was going on, and there was uh, movements afoot to ban lead paint, right? It actually happened in some countries. Uh, and there was a discussion in the Journal of the American Medical Association linking childhood lead poisoning and lead paint as early as 1924, okay? Um, nonetheless, and this is, you know, thanks to the America First Harding administration, uh, they did not go along with the, the, with the global trends in understanding the toxicity of this thing. Uh, instead, and this is in some ways to the credit of the progressive movement of the time, there's a development of something called industrial hygiene, which now we think of as being sort of safety precautions, with people washing their hands and wearing dust masks and having adequate ventilation in factories that are involved in the production of industrial lead products, right? At the same time, this is an ad here for the, the ethyl sign, right? This is an ad for leaded gas. And just as the research is coming out saying, you know, yeah, lead toxicity is pretty bad, you shouldn't be around kids, there's a whole new application of it. And not only are they, well, I'll, I'll discuss more about the effects of, uh, of leaded gas. But anyway, as leaded gas is introduced, there is a systematic marginalization of the complaints about, uh, about lead poisoning, uh, as well as a, a capture of the research into lead toxicity by the lead industry itself. Uh, and the development of something called the Keyhole Rule. Keyhole was, uh, a physician and a researcher who worked at Kettering Labs under the payment of um, the lead industry. Right? He was well funded and he established in the, the levels of industrial plumbism, right? what is considered to be lead poisoned at 60 micrograms per deciliter right? from observation of, uh, of people um, in, that were you know, suffering uh, the observed effects of lead, lead toxicity. Um, and there was a sense, and you see this throughout the discussion of uh, sort of industrial processes, they said, well, you know, we can't ban lead unless we're absolutely certain. And the science that you're presenting us is not absolutely certain. And that into this steps Claire Patterson, uh, who's a geochemist. And he accidentally finds that lead is everywhere because as a geochemist, he was tasked with aging, dating the age of the plant. And to do this, you use this uranium lead dating, where you look at very tiny, very, very small amounts of lead. Very, uh, and you compare ratios of uh, this uranium isotope to the lead isotope, and that will helps you determine the age of the, the rocks, and that will help you determine the age of the planet. Uh, uh, he was working with a partner. He was tasked with lead. His partner was tasked with uranium. 
His partner was able to measure the uranium immediately, got his PhD, went on with his career. Patterson looked at the amount of lead, and there was too much. And he scrubbed everything down, and he looked at the amount of lead in his sample, and there was too much. Right? And so what he ended up developing was the ultra-clean ultra laboratory process. And he did this out of necessity. And in the process, he found something that he was not looking for through the application of pure, or we might say basic, scientific research. Uh, that uh, we had contaminated the planet. Every continent, every biome, every climate with measurable, appreciable amounts of lead. Right? And he could do this with absolute precision because of the nature of his project. Right? And when he started to talk about this, um, the, the rest of his career was playing whack-a-mole. And then people said, well, you know, volcanism can release uh, natural amounts of lead into the atmosphere. And so then, as a good geochemist did, he went and examined the amount of volcanism and estimated it. And he said, well, no, not really. It doesn't work out. It's not the right amount. What he did was he established the difference between natural amounts of lead toxicity and normal amounts of lead toxicity. And this is a totally gross graph or a chart, right? This is it. Uh, and that this, the middle figure, this is his famous measles chart, or uh, measles figure, right? And that, that the middle figure was considered to be normal and natural amount of lead loading. Right? And what he showed, that's uh, a thousand, uh, it's a thousand parts, uh, parts per person, right? Just in this general estimation, that that was normal in uh, mid century America, but actually, examination of Peruvian <coughs> skeletons, etc., cetera, that uh, that was a thousand times more exposed to lead toxicity than uh, was the natural amount, right? And that the index of, of industrial plumbism was set at this level right here, right? That's four times as much as that, which is a lot, right? But what you were experiencing and what he was able to measure precisely was that there was a thousand times more exposure to lead than what was natural in that process. And that indeed we had no idea what that was doing to us as humans. Uh, and so he goes on and there's some discussion that perhaps we can date the, the Anthropocene to the beginning of the, what's the cupellation process, right? For making metallic currencies. Uh, you go and you end up creating some amount of aerosol lead in that process. And, and that's what these people here are sort of finding. Uh, it's a recent paper that came out that is looking at a glacier in Switzerland, right? And they say, well, it turns out that there's measurable amounts of background uh, lead deposited on this glacier. And we can see that it's going on for at least 2,000 years. And it's anthropogenic, right? And the only time in the last 2,000 years that it falls off from this uh, normal to natural levels are three years in the 15th century when Europe was being decimated by, yeah, the plague. And so all the sort of metallurgical activities had stopped. And it went back to the normal amount. And then it whoop, pops right back up. Right? Uh, and so um, this, is a, uh, this is something that was discovered through the application of a basic scientific research, right? Uh, and it is not a profitable enterprise to engage in this sort of thing. And it is absolutely a possibility and perhaps a requirement that a currency sovereign support this sort of activity, right? That what he was able to find is of profound, I would almost imagine, inestimable significance to every person in this room, okay? Um, so, uh, with that, then I'm going to return to sort of my thing, which is the application of what this understanding engenders, right? Which is investigation of lead toxicity at the individual level and with a tremendous amount of precision. Um, so this is a map. This is all of the cases of lead poisoning, all measured cases of lead, well, just le childhood blood lead level in Kansas City for 12 years. Uh, and it was um, done as... Um, an application of the geocoding process that Ben uh, discussed before. And it's towards the integration of uh, these health encounters with uh, housing conditions and also other conditions in the lived environment. OK? 
Okay. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, schematic of the geocoding process. We can get into it if you're into it, but um, I'll forgive you if you're not into it. I should say that um, the funding, some funding for this initial process was provided by, the, uh, by HUD. Right, so that there is some government funding that went into this process. They're not funding the current research, um, but they did put money into the original, in, into the original project. Um, and that uh, as part of this, there's a, a potential for a combination of data from a variety of different sources. Uh, from the EPA, I used uh, information from the CEI, from MARC, which is a, a, an organization that's uh, designed to coordinate regional activities among different stakeholders, um, and the census and a variety of other things. Uh, and so we can apply this, we can actually go and look at the proper level of people living in their environment and look at the way the environment is affecting the way they live. GIS is an incredible tool for doing just that and visualizing it, okay? Um, so kind of walk you through this a little bit. This is, uh, these are housing conditions, these are just exterior paint conditions. So the, the basic thought on here, matching up uh, sort of an MMT, a job guarantee program, is that, well, so historically, lead poisoning is associated with older homes because older homes were painted with lead, right? So we're not gonna go and replace the entire housing stock. Perhaps there's an easy way of noticing which homes need repair. So this is essentially an application of that idea. So the idea is that the, the, paint, the homes with substandard exterior paint, perhaps we can identify those, Associate, associating them, them with childhood lead poisoning, and then we could get what we're looking for, which is a place to target our interventions. Uh, and so this is age of housing, and as you see, in, this is again the Lycans neighborhood that Ben mentioned previously, uh, that this is mostly a uniform age of home, right? So it makes more sense to use that other metric, actually the exterior metric, and so this is another way of sort of visualizing it. I've, I've gone and I've thrown in uh, characteristics of uh, health, uh, health encounters. Uh, and so the deeper the red, the older the home, the more consolidated the health encounter and also the worst condition of the pain, right? So you can visualize that. Uh, GIS does this really well. And then I can run the regression. Boop. And then as we see over here, these are preliminary results on about 2,100 encounters. So this is not the final results, but these are the, the preliminary results. And we see, uh, this is my uh, exterior paint bad category. And over here, you know, that's the lots of stars and that's the right, you know, th you know hey man. Uh, anyway, uh, so this suggests, right? A job guarantee, we target those homes. And guess what? They've been talking about this for 30 years. This is a shovel ready project from 1990. Uh, conservative, I mean, they've done the cost benefit on this, right? This 17 to 1 is the conservative estimate of the return of lead remediation on homes, right? 200 to 1. You don't want to talk about, um, anyway. So, again, extending the powers of GIS. That what I've done is I just ran a simple regression that GIS is not required for. It lets us see it very clearly, but it's not a GIS function. One of the things that GIS has allowed us to do, people in the, ep in the epidemiology uh, world in particular, is they've, they've been able to see other sources of lead poisoning, other sinks of lead in the environment. And one of the really important ones they've been talking about is soil loading, right? Uh, and that soil becomes loaded in a variety of ways. One of the ways that I'm particularly concerned about is demolitions. You tear down a home that was built in 1920, it's got several layers of lead paint, has lead on the interior process, and they just tear that down. Uh, so cloud of toxic, toxic dust, let's take a look at that. But let's also associate it with, uh, let's also associate it with historic roadways. So you have aerosol lead coming out of the tailpipes. And let's associate that as well with vacant lots, right? Where maybe people have parked cars for a long time. And then also let's look at the location of a historic gas station. So this is what uh, GIS allows you to do to really target, and this would be a more expansive application of a job guarantee program to go engage in that soil remediation, to actually remediate it as opposed to, as now the general practice is, 
is a clean cover, right? That's just kicking the can down the road. Uh, so we can do it. The returns to it, when they talk about the monetary returns, they are not, uh, they're not talking about the value of a job. It's, it's perf yeah, anyway. So after this initial project has been run, then we can turn it around and we can use this as a predictive tool. So we can go and use public health in the way it was designed to be and as a preventative tool. So uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Okay, so uh, for my presentation, my work mostly has to do with asthma in Kansas City. Um, and rather than go into some of the specifics about how to model it and some of the factors we're really concerned with, I will touch on those. I thought it might be helpful to kind of illustrate why um, MMT matters in this kind of uh, research and how an interdisciplinary research itself is, is a really important feature of what I think should be kind of a heterodox economic approach to dealing with this kind of social inequity. So um, I don't want to turn this off. All right. Uh, I'm going to start by just like kind of illustrating the basic uh, MMT framework that is the background for all of this research. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting that none of us are really trying to convince you of MMT, <laughs> but really we're taking it as a given because, you know, whatever problems you have with it, um, this offers a lot of potential for us. And GIS is one tool for helping to design MMT and job guarantees specifically to get the most out of it, to treat specific problems at the local level. Um, and then for me, because my background is in the environmental studies, I really work in a systems theory way. So uh, institutional economic theory, parts of it are definitely consistent with it, but what I find uh, really helpful is that that's really derived from the um, the ecological studies and environmental studies and environmental ethics. So it's consistent with some of those other disciplines working in the field and it helps me bring in these other tools and these other ideas that I think are really important to being able to define the problem and thus solve it. Um, and finally I'll just kind of breeze over the case study that um, I'm using kind of as a basis for my dissertation, which is childhood asthma in Kansas City. And um, since I think we'll have a little extra time, I might mention some of the extra work we've been doing at CEI in um, proposing a local centralized source of data that can be shared and used in health disparities research locally and to support a system uh, whereby practitioners can connect their patients with uh, relevant community resources in a GIS framework and um, how that relates to I think what some of us have is an ideal long-term goal of being able to involve employment in uh, treating public health problems directly. Um, so very basic conception of the job guarantee, the idea that if you increase employment, you're going to potentially increase economic stability or create some where there is none, and then in the process improve uh, social equity and economic equality. So. The benefit from our perspective, and part of why people like myself got into this, is because we can see that as a great tool. So we can start to use this employment to do things in our communities that we need to have done. Um, one being the obvious issue of sustainability, generally. And so I think what you'll see throughout this presentation, and I'm sure you've kind of gathered from the others, is that um, in order that there is not an equal say in how things are saved, how things are built and what our environments look like over time. So taking into consideration that, that inequity and being able to c contribute to the process for parts of the community is um, something we would want to consider. So while it's a logical way to create and sustain employment at a living wage, um, we really want to know how do we use it to reduce those inequalities that we see that are more nuanced and not just in terms of employment or income, uh, but related to it and um, how do we use it to achieve that kind of social and environmental sustainability that's really important to being able to, to solve long-term problems. So GIS is a part of answering those problems. Um, 
it's an investigative tool, obviously. Um, if I'm going to do some kind of data analysis having to do with asthma and the environment, I use GIS to collect a lot of my data. Um, and it's an illustrative tool. I think that's just as important because it's a way for us to communicate with stakeholders. So I'm going to kind of go through in a minute some of the things that I'm collecting and considering and um, talk about building an index in order to communicate with stakeholders in the community in a way that's actually comprehensible. So, you know, this is what we think might be a social vulnerability or an environmental hazard in your community, but we need people to be able to see that and identify that and be able to communicate about it. So, um, and obviously, interdisciplinary tool. So I can collect all my information in there and look at the correlation between them spatially. So MMT really informs GIS analysis in that it changes what we view to be possible. That's particularly important in, in what we're dealing with, which is in part environmental epidemiology. There's this really uh, you know, confusing relationship, complicated relationship between all these physical factors, environmental factors, and social, demographic, and economic factors. So we start to see what we usually consider as confounding variables as effect modifiers, which is what we're learning in environmental epidemiology, and that we can start to include those in part of our treatment plan, rather than just looking at those really easy primary modifiable exposures that you might typically consider, like an environmental hazard. So systems theory is kind of my preferred starting off point for conceptualizing how to arrange my research in a way that I'm doing the best I can to answer um, a question and in a way that other people can follow and replicate. So um, it's a comprehensive and pragmatic analytical framework, and it's looking at one problem as a part of a system and considering all the interrelated features of that system and uh, the system dynamics that contribute to its, to its uh, evolution through time. Um, in particular, we're all really talking about intergenerational inequality. So it's starting from a system standpoint, and trying to think about, well, this health disparity is one outcome of this intergenerational inequality. You can start to understand why it's so important to involve economics in some of these other disciplines. Because this health disparity, a public health issue, um, you can think of it as an economic problem with possible economic solutions. Um, and leverage points are really in that framework, the places to intervene in a system. So it's not just lead paint that's the problem. It's also inequality, because that lead paint and the hazards of it, poor housing conditions are not equally distributed over space and in different communities. So that's kind of how I built my research framework. I just need to answer these basic questions, which is why the problem exists, use whatever tools I have available. And the first uh, question I'm using spatial and institutional analysis. Um, and in the second, I'm really considering the scale also. So we talk about sustainability in global terms, but really to achieve that, you're going to have to take into consideration some of those local inequalities. Um, so childhood asthma in Kansas City. Earlier we saw some um, maps of how it's distributed. I made a point density map, so that's density per square mile, of acute care visits. So and this is just for one year, and it's in 2010. Um, you'll notice that some of the areas on the map will continue to stay white. There is nothing, <laughs> and kind of literally they are also white, <laughs> because there is, uh, it's not that I haven't mapped them. It's not that the data isn't there, it's because you'll see there's not a concentration of these indicators as we go through it. So basically start with the institutional analysis, move on to a data analysis that uses that initial investigation of all parts of the problem, how it may have originated. Um, what factors we think might contribute most. Um, and I do want to mention that in this first section, my planned research, which obviously is not totally finished, I'm going to be using an environmental justice screening method. So that's one way of collecting that information that I referenced before in a way that you can communicate with stakeholders in the community and also identify what you think might be the major factors of concern for this type of disparity. The data analysis is going to have to be inherently exploratory because we're trying to figure out what factors are most important within each community. Um, and then my question in general is focused on the social determinants of health. So in the public health literature, we're really concerned with this wide range of factors, not just environmental, not just socioeconomic. And um, my hypothesis is that where you see um, the disparity here in Kansas City, Kansas, for example, 
the factors that are going to be most important to that disparity may not be the same as if you look at the east side neighborhood right here, where there's a huge concentration. And the reason for that is because of the distribution of some of those social and uh, economic and environmental factors. This here is another uh, example of the modifiable aerial unit problem, which I don't recall if Ben went into too much. But the point here is that I'm using community districts to look at um, some of these factors. Community districts are an aggregation of similar neighborhoods. So it involves socially relevant boundaries, and we can look at, and I have it mapped here on most of the maps, uh, this is a historic, uh, his, the historic Troost Avenue corridor, um, which is, you'll associate by the end of this with segregation in Kansas City by both race and income. That being very important because um, one of the things that I think, I don't know if it's too much to go into today, but when we talk about being able to treat some of these problems in the context of historic inequality like this, spatially, we want to consider the fact that that segregation is also associated with historic black neighborhoods or historic Latino neighborhoods up in Kansas City, Kansas as well. So when you talk about trying to fix the problem, you're not necessarily trying to dismantle those cultural structures and keeping that in mind while you're designing policy is really important, as well as asking the questions, in my opinion, so. Um, so this, the last map showed um, poverty, or poverty, as I have it spelled out there. This one is uh, the percent of the population within each area is identified as minority, according to the census. So that segregation is fairly consistent by both race and income. And if you zoom in on one of those areas, right here along that historic Troost Avenue corridor, you'll notice that there's a dramatic difference in the amount of vacancy and dangerous buildings and problem properties from the east side of Troost over here to the west side of Troost over here. So you can see from the start that when you have a concentration of asthma encounters in those east side neighborhoods, directly adjacent to historically white, wealthier neighborhoods, that this disease, and it's, it's obvious in the literature as well, it's not as simple as just being an environmental exposure problem. It's also um, mixed with this historic inequality. Um, and when I talked about the, the importance of income in this problem and cultural and historic neighborhoods, the segregation and the subsequent white flight that happened and the development of these suburbs out here, um, it was really kind of, I, I'm just trying to, to get across that it is not as, um, it's not as simple as looking at it as um, just a social problem. So here I have land use. If we're wanting to consider all the potential factors that might contribute to the disparity within each neighborhood, this is another thing you can consider. Land use is typically used in whatever kind of data analysis you have of asthma. Um, you also have the distribution of point sources of air pollution. While this is, again, an environmental problem, and you can see that there's clustering in relevant places, especially surrounding Kansas City, Kansas, for example, or in the Old Northeast, um, you can't necessarily say that that is the factor that's most important in each neighborhood. So this last map is actually of age of housing, which is really important to Neil's work as well. But it's just to accentuate that what I was trying to get at earlier, that segregation in the center of town is really associated with a disinvestment. So an active disinvestment process in those historic minority neighborhoods. So an exploratory analysis some initial regression results indicate that yes, race and ethnicity are very important, as well as um, income, and so are housing conditions. But that for future analysis, what I really need to do is dig down and figure out what the differences are between those neighborhoods. Because if we're gonna design a policy in order to treat this one problem, we also need to address the structural problem, the structural conditions that have created this intergenerational inequality and that the way we treat it specifically within each neighborhood should take into consideration those current and um, or unique factors within each place. So sustainable solutions generally should be based on all the information that we have available. And so in, the, in this case, we're gonna be taking um, 
all that GIS and that screening in order to develop our data analysis process to test our conclusions and try and figure out what is the best treatment plan, um, where, what the best, best interventions are, and MMT really helps to expand what we view to be possible in order to address that. And that um, really, at the end of the day, uh, whether or not a job guarantee successfully treats some of these long-term um, consequences of inequality depends on this type of really involved local planning and development. So um, I don't know if Doug has anything to say in addition to this, or Jordan, because I know Jordan may have wanted to say something along these lines, because part of what uh, Jordan was going to present, he uh, put together this whole conference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so he, so he may not have had quite the opportunity to, to work towards his own panel. <laughs> but part of what we talk about is, um, okay, so for example, Bernie Sanders, trillion dollars towards infrastructure. If you don't take into consideration this historic segregation in Kansas City and inequality, and don't take into consideration that people in different parts of the city do not have the same voice in how things are built or how development happens, there's no reason that that kind of um, inequality isn't going to be exacerbated with additional growth and development in your place. Um, and in Kansas City, I should note that it, there's no restriction to urban sprawl. It's a great case study for urban sprawl because geographically, it's never going to stop. And also socially, there's no reason we should expect it to stop. And so that's one thing that um, Jordan has been focusing on some in his own research is um, the importance of transportation planning and access to jobs. So, yeah, and the, the non-theory non cost of unemployment. Um, so we have uh, an uneven landscape of structural inequalities. When you implement, say, a job guarantee program, uh, how that shakes out the local level um, through the governance structures, through how the program's uh, set up, through how where the money goes where the jobs are, uh, how you get to those jobs matters, right? Where we place those jobs matter. And also, it's, uh, it makes it a quite a messy process. And I, and, I don't, and I don't think that it's been neglected necessarily in it, through an MMT approach or the, in the literature. Uh, but it's something that I think begs, and it's, it's been called for more focus on the, the real local uh, performance management or the local uh, implications of a job guarantee program. How do you design it to not only uh, not exacerbate environmental uh, or sustainability, environmental sustainability, or environmental in inequalities and exposure to adverse health outcomes or uh, social determinants of health. Um, but also, how do we design it to where the, those jobs are, um, one, supporting the development, the sustainable development of communities, supporting the access uh, to jobs um, for people who need them, and not just exacerbating these uh, structural inequalities around race and class. I'm not sure I have anything at all that I could add to the presentations that you've had from uh, Ben and Neil and Natalie and, and Jordan's comments as well. Uh, it's like I said, uh, kind of hinted at at least at the beginning, uh, I feel it's a real privilege to have uh, colleagues like this working with us at the CEI and um, uh, we just, you know, anyway, thank you all for for what you have presented here today and the work you're continuing to do. Um, we are fortunate to have the opportunity to be moving forward with the uh, Greater Kansas City Health uh, Care Foundation. Uh, we're sort of in a conversation with them about building a, uh, a long-range, multi-year regional health initiative, regional health research initiative. Uh, that they're proposing to fund. And in fact, what we do here in Kansas City, uh, I believe Ben has got some great ideas about how to sort of mirror that activity in the uh, uh, central New York, Syracuse, Ithaca, Cortland region, if I'm not mistaken. And um, so we've got a, I guess the bottom line here is we've got some great people working on the project. We've got a fabulous research team. We've got an active uh, long-run research agenda in regional health disparities approached or viewed through the context of the social determinants of health. And um, we have, you know, a, a fairly um, 
what we think looks to be a, a fairly reliable uh, funding source that's going to be developing in the next few months. So um, I think that's pretty much the, the overall view. Am I missing anything, you guys? Can we throw this open to questions? You want to do it that way? So Mitch, take it away. I'll just uh, start with a comment. First of all, great presentation, fascinating data analysis and maps. Um, and I want to just kind of point out, Neil, you used the framing, um, kick the can down the road in your presentation, which reminded me of a larger theme so far today, which has been <coughs> about rhetoric and framing around MMT. And so this seems like the perfect kind of project where you can say, you can reclaim the sort of don't saddle our grandchildren with a debt they can never pay off. Because these sort of health outcomes are debts that, are, that you can't pay off. You won't get that time back. And so it's sort of like, you know, we can't afford to not make these investments. We can't afford to not. And so <coughs> kicking the can down the road, I think, is a really good metaphor and an opportunity to use that in your language. And then I'll stop talking. Uh, just a quick follow-up on, on Mitch's point that if you, if you put dollar amounts on, on the health consequences, on the cost, the real cost, the inclusive of all uh, the public health costs, then forget about MMT. Just, just based on a cost-benefit analysis, if you take this into account, then it doesn't make any sense not to invest in the job creation type of program that doesn't that doesn't exacerbate these things, but actually addresses the root causes of these problems and, and eliminates the long-term consequences of this. Um, so yes, we're, we're all for MMT and job guarantee, but even if you exclude that, just take an inclusive cost-benefit analysis of the healthcare cost, because this is a real cost to society. Uh, and if we don't include it in the analysis, then we're just focusing on you know, dollars uh, excluding the health effects is uh, it's uh, kicking the can down the road and not addressing the root causes. That's part of why I don't feel I don't think that any of us feel like we need to defend MMT or the job guarantee as an option. Um, just because it is the most sensible treatment plan, especially um, if you're talking about obvious disparities in health that are associated with all of these other social and economic um, costs and burdens that can be treated with a job guarantee. So. So, first off, great presentations, everybody. I'm super impressed at the kind of work that is being done at CEI. And also, when I was a graduate student here, I was part of the research group at CFEPS. And uh, uh, we, CFEPS and CEI kind of collaborated with the state of black Kansas City uh, uh, two or three times. And but it's, now it's really cool to see how uh, you know, the work that we did at CFAPS and the work you guys are doing at CEI are kind of coming, all coming together to build one awesome research agenda that I don't think any, anyone else is doing. Any other uh, universities are, you know, studying these things. So it, it's really awesome. So, uh, uh, but quickly, I have a question about your model. Uh, <laughs> well, and both of yours. So you said that they were uh, an exploratory results, right? Uh, but you didn't look at, I don't, you didn't look at any interaction effects. So that's, that's okay. actually what we were, we were Okay. We were both just kind of like, we, oh yeah, I, I guess I should speak it on the mic. Yeah, no, no, no. That, that's not at all representative of what we consider to be exploratory. Oh, okay. I mean, that's like preliminary, <laughs> like I was messing around in R, honestly. Okay. <laughs> um, no, no, what I plan to do uh, for my analysis, since I'm going to have so many covariates to include, because when we're talking about all those potential indicators of elevated exposure to traffic-related air pollution or other noxious elements, whatever, um, on top of all the socioeconomic factors and then also neighborhood factors. Um, there's a lot of multicollinearity that you end up with, and that's a big problem in environmental epidemiology. So I'm, uh, what I plan to do is put it into, a, use Bayesian methods and do a clustering analysis to identify you know, what group of covariates is associated with the highest risk of a disease outcome as one way of starting to whittle, like really hone in on for each community what is the most important factor that you would need to design your policy to treat. So, and similar to the, uh, to the reality that the model I presented was preposterously simple, <laughs> um, that some of that is... I didn't say that. No, I said that. I said that. <laughs> you know, I'm freely admitting it. Uh, part of that has to do with the... Uh, 
problems that I associate with uh, using statistical inference to build a new research agenda. That one of the things that CEI has is the detailed housing level observations, and that is a nobody sort of has that and is using it for this sort of uh, research. That there's the idea, uh, the warranted idea, that this is a legitimate mode of investigation, but there is no established literature. So taking sort of tiny steps, before I interact the variables, let's look at them right. not interacted, yeah. Yeah. you know? Yeah, no. uh, yeah. And I, absolutely. Yeah, no, and, and I have interacted the variables and things get more complicated. Uh, it just to make the point that I was trying to make is that using the simplest model, we can see right. that, you know, fixing homes, fixing windows is, makes sense, you know? Uh, so, uh, I won't So my, my, my own thinking on that was like, you would have, if you had some uh, people, even in the you know, East Texas or whatever, they may have had an older home, but they may have had enough income Right. Uh. That's <laughs> yeah. That's that's part of the problem yeah, process, yeah. and that's one of the, the reasons that our, our main contact with Children's Mercy uh, really pushed for this grant and this project because it's not just um, the age of the home; it's the condition of the home. Right. That, yeah. You know, it's associated with. Well, I, I think we can get a little bogged down by the whole specification of models. I mean, we can look at the pictures, and the pictures. You know, say a thousand words, and the other real benefit of the pictures and the spatial analysis is that it invites the conversation from people that live in those spaces. You know, what is their uh, interpretation of what is going on, and what solutions do they want? You know, this isn't a top-down sort of policy analysis where we want to go into neighborhoods and fix it for them. We, this is an interactive process of community engagement and. Uh, thinking about what is important for everyone as we move forward uh, with policy and thinking about jobs and these sorts of issues. Uh, first of all, um, the, the research projects that you guys are, are working on, it, it's good to see these results coming to uh, some fruition. It's, it's very good work. Information is always good. And the way that this is presented and, th and thought about, I think, is very um, um, easy to present to non-academics, to people in the community. It's, it's in pictures and it shows. In some sense, it shows what, what people already know, but it lets them know that they are part of a larger problem. It's just not on their block. So, so, so this is exceptional. Uh, now, having said that, uh, d let me let me say that I think that there's an aspirational goal for all of this work, right? To, to, it's involved in social justice, and I think the, the the there's a kind of an underlying belief that is in contradiction to that aspiration, and that belief I think is that once you give the the powers that be, the people, for example, who could make money happen. Once you give them the information that this is the problem, that they will be interested in fixing it. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and so, you know, let's look at just the recent election. We have uh, half the electorate who voted for someone who we know is not interested in this at all. And then there's the contention, the, uh, the, the, the fight that's going on in the Democratic Party the other side among progressives and new Democrats, and from an analysis of the, hist of the history, new Democrats are not interested in fixing this. If there's anyone who's interested in this issue, it would be progressives, but they're not a majority, okay? And they don't have the power to do this. And so for me, the long wait as, as minority communities have had to, for the powers that be, the federal government, to finally realize realize that there's a problem and then want to do something about it is not going to happen. That, okay, and, and, and so for me, MMT does say have something to say about how communities themselves can utilize what they have as power to get this done, even from an understanding of money, that money is not just 
something that the federal government can create, okay? My, I, I can create money in my household. I can create money on my block, in my neighborhood, in my community. And, and there are communities around the world that have, that have done so. So for, for me, the, a message of MMT for this situation is that money is simply uh, you know, something that can be created. You don't have to make, uh, a, 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 if you have the resources to get things done, then you can always finance that process. And so the emphasis for me in development is focusing on what, what resources community have communities have, and then to get them to understand that they cannot wait for the federal government, the state government, the city government to come in and address these issues, that they can finance them and they need to go forward to do that. So, so uh, I, I, I gave a talk this morning, something about that with regard to California and, and, and single payer, but it needs to, it needs to come from a small, even, a, even a lower level. Uh, and, and I think that's part of an, uh, another challenge. Are there any presentations in the entire conference on local currency issues? No, but there should be. That's yeah. really not good. <laughs> Next conference will take care of it, but in the meantime, we'll have to talk about it. Sure. Okay. Oh, I uh, uh, Don't you have a paper on it? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren might be talking about that tomorrow on okay. the panel for developing. Uh, so, uh, I, just recognizing that uh, anecdotes uh, don't make science, but I do live at 75th and Troost. Uh, and um, some things that we have run across in our neighborhood trying to get things done. Absentee ownership. Uh, we don't know who has these houses. Some of them are in big investment blocks, so they're owned by a thousand people who don't even know where their thousand houses that they own are. Um, we have people who are uh, sentimentally attached to the home that their father lived in, so they decide that it's better to let it dilapidate than to sell it. Um, and so, you know, they don't recognize the fact that they're, what they're holding on to is a depreciating asset. They think, oh, home prices always go up or something, and so well, when I retire, you know, maybe I'll sell it. Um, so uh, trying to, so we have in, in our just immediate area, we have on either side of us an empty abandoned house. Uh, behind us, Caddy Corner, and an empty abandoned house, and two across the street from us. The other two across the street are Section 8 homes, and uh, many of that is also many other homes like that further down the block. So um, these uh, these inequalities are also uh, within the block itself in terms of uh, not just like what what type of ownership there is, and whether or not you're renting or owning, but also even when uh, there's homes that are owned. I mean, the lady that lives next to us that's letting this particular house completely dilapidate, she lives three blocks away. Um, and this, uh, this home has um, been, I mean, the doors have blown open in the past and we've sort of seen into it. It's, it's, it's an awful, awful health. No one, it's, it's not unhealthy to walk in there, right? You're gonna have this kind of uh, rodents and things, nesting, all this kind of stuff. Uh, this is all going on in that place. By the way, mm -hmm. and um, I, I can't emphasize enough how even over that short distance, like I'm, I'm two, three blocks from True. Well, I'm, I'm two, three blocks from True. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm a couple blocks away, east of Paseo. Oh, between uh -huh. Paseo and Woodland. But the point is, no one else in here. That means nothing to you. I get it. But <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, deeper into those neighborhoods and. Um, so I just, I just, I do think that personal anecdotes are important because, like, uh, I had there, there are slum lords <laughs> throughout these neighborhoods. Um, we do have a lot of vacant houses in our in our neighborhood, for example. But we finally got some good neighbors next to us in a rental property, and the sewage line broke out in the street. So this was on the sidewalk, running down the hill for two months, and the city didn't fix it. We are. You know, if it were even two blocks into Troostwood, east of Troost, but closer to that line, it would have been fixed. So it's just absolutely a public health problem in a lot of ways. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. My point was about it also addressing, you know, you have this big problem with property rights themselves, the way we let people buy homes. 
the way we allow them to treat homes, all of those policies are also a big complicating factor. Right? Yeah, I think uh, this is a perfect example of what you asked us. Right? The, the diversity of the conversation that's occurring just here in the last 10 minutes goes from global, you know, major national issues all the way down to who my neighbors are. And it's all being viscerally created because we identify with the places where we live and we can share those experiences. So GIS is really one of the one of the premier tools for opening and engaging in meaningful interdisciplinary discourse because all of our disciplines take place in space. And so this is, you know, the common denominator of lived human experiences. And to your question about absentee ownership, one of the more interesting variable points that we've created at CEI is a metric of ownership. So a one for lives in the house on the parcel, a two for lives in the neighborhood, a three I think is in Kansas City, Missouri, four in the metropolitan area, and then five beyond six unknown. And you can see uh, we've done some of the housing conditions analysis and the level of disorder in relation to ownership and uh, where ownership takes place, and those variables are very much related. So, uh, very good point there. Uh, I just want to say briefly something about lead toxicity and the uh, things that we should be able to do with uh, the research uh, underway right now regarding the demolition practices of the city and the population in general. That. As, in, as someone who lives next to a home that is dilapidated, the desire is to get rid of it or to fix it. The easiest thing to do is get rid of it, just pull it down. Um, and developing a sense and understanding of how incredible, well, is it bad? Maybe it's not a problem. But we should really know that. And we'll, we should be, and we'll be able to know that. Um, and my suspicion is that it's extraordinarily bad. We're creating a problem for a long time, you know, kicking the can down the road, explicitly. So, um, so there, there may be some usefulness in that beyond, uh, you know, sometimes not doing anything. It's, uh, this, is, this is how most of our conversations end up. They get very depressing, and then <laughs> we just kind of trail off hopelessly. So, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so that we end on something not depressing. Uh, next, next Friday and Saturday, from noon on Friday to 6 p.m. on Saturday, I and others will in be involved in a radiothon on KPRS, that's uh, Hot 103, and KPRT, which is Gospel AM 1590. Uh, the uh, purpose of the radiothon is to raise the final um, uh, startup capital for Community Development Credit Union, which we call We Development Credit Union. And part of We Development's credit union uh, mission is to be involved in developing community currency processes. So um, I'll, I'll send this flyer out on the, on the um, uh, listserv. So. Um, well, I is it time to wind up, you think? Anybody else? Um, have we all run through our repertoire? <laughs> or, or, or not? Okay. I think uh, that's a, a good signal that it's time to call, th call things um, quits for the, for the day, right? This is the last. Last panel session's off mm -hmm. the dinner now. Dinner okay, all right. And, and dinner is a. Pearson, so Pearson Auditorium, we're the same place where lunch was. So, uh, hope you all have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.